Today, we're going to be talking about progressive pulmonary fibrosis, improving recognition, diagnosis, and patient communications. I'm Vic Kangora. I'm pulmonary critical care faculty with the ANOVA Advanced Lung Disease and Lung Transplant Department, as well as the Director of Advanced Obstructive Lung Diseases at ANOVA Fairfax Hospital in Falls Church, Virginia. So a couple of learning objectives for this talk to start with. We want to identify the signs and symptoms of PPF to improve diagnosis in accordance with the updated guidelines. We also want to apply strategies to improve communication with and education of patients newly diagnosed with PPF. Let's dive into our first case. So a little bit of background. Fibrosing ILDs encompass a number of diverse conditions. They overlap in their clinical presentation, imaging, and histopathological patterns. We know IPF is sort of the prototype of fibrosing ILDs, but that progressive fibrosing lung disease can occur in connective tissue diseases, idiopathic NSIP, unclassifiable ILD, and chronic HP, just to name a handful there. And we know that a significant proportion of patients that have fibrosing ILDs other than IPF will develop a progressive fibrosing phenotype over time. I think up until this point, there have been a lot of muddied waters in terms of terminology, both in the literature and in clinical practice, we see all the above terms used. Um, we've seen progressive fibrosing ILD, ILD of the progressive fibrosing phenotype, and a number of others. I, I personally have even used probably every single one of these at some point or another, both in manuscripts as well as in clinical practice. And unfortunately, up until now, we've really had no unifying definition for this progressive fibrosing phenotype. And amongst clinical trials, we've seen various criteria used to define and describe this disease. And then finally, in May of 2022, we had uh, International Society Practice Guideline Updates. And this was a uh, consortium of American, European, Japanese, and Latin American thoracic and respiratory societies that got together and said, you know, we need to have a uniform definition and terminology for this disease process. And so um, they came up with the term progressive pulmonary fibrosis. They chose pulmonary fibrosis because Patients and clinicians are familiar with the term pulmonary fibrosis, and it describes what we're seeing in these patients. And then the progressive term obviously really uh, captures what we're seeing in these patients who, who have fibrosis that's occurring in a non-IPF-related disease process. And then luckily, we were also provided with a consensus definition with both radiologic and physiologic criteria. So when we look at the definition for PPF, this is in a patient who has an ILD of either a known or unknown etiology. The key here to remember is that this is in a non-IPF patient. So it's an ILD that is not IPF, who has radiologic evidence of pulmonary fibrosis, and that satisfies at least two of the following three criteria within the last year. The other key thing to remember here is that there is no alternative explanation. So the definition includes one, worsening respiratory symptoms, Two, physiologic evidence of disease progression with either of the following, an absolute decline in FVC greater than or equal to 5% within the last year, an absolute decline in DLCO greater than or equal to 10% predicted within the last year, or three, one of the following radiologic findings on CT scan. And that could include, you know, new ground glass opacities with traction bronchiectasis, new traction, new reticulation newer increased honeycombing, um, or an increased coarseness of the reticular abnormalities that are present. To highlight the point that you must rule out an alternative explanation is that you may have a patient that has worsening respiratory symptoms, and let's say an absolute decline in their DLCO of over 10% in the last year. And that patient may not have PPF. That patient may have pulmonary hypertension that's developed. And so it's key to remember that we must also evaluate for all alternative explanations when applying this definition. So let's get into our first case. We've got Mr. W. He's a 57-year-old male. He has a history of hypertension and GERD, not currently on any medications. He was referred to you by his internist because he's had worsening dyspnea exertion and cough for the last six months. He describes the cough as being mildly productive, mostly worse in the morning, otherwise really only complains of malaise, doesn't really have many other complaints. We get an expanded history from him. He's an accountant that works from home. He's never smoked. Uh, he has minimal alcohol use and no history of illicit substance use. And probing him further, there's really no recreational or occupational exposures otherwise that you can identify. He doesn't have any pets in the home. As far as he's aware, he's also got no mold in the home. Uh, he has no down bedding, 
notably, he does have a few birdhouses in his backyard that he frequently cleans and refills. On exam, he appears well-developed and non-toxic. His vitals are largely normal. His room air pulse ox, though, is at 95%. On lung auscultation, you hear that he's got a few scattered rails, but it is otherwise clear. Skin and joint exam otherwise is totally unremarkable. So we get pulmonary function testing, and we see both his FVC and FVV1 are reduced with a preserved ratio. His total lung capacity is also mildly reduced, and his DLCO is reduced. So we see a mild restrictive abnormality here with a reduction in his DLCO. We do a six-minute walk test as well, and he walks 320 meters, which is probably less than we would expect for someone of his age and weight. His SPO2 nadir was 88% of room air during that walk, and he reported a max Borg score of six, so it had significant dyspnea with the walk as well. Of course, we've got to get a CAT scan, right? We all like the pretty pictures. We've got to see how his lungs look under CT. And so we do that. We get a CAT scan. We see a number of findings. As highlighted by the errors, you see ground glass opacity, and you see mosaicism, which is representing air trapping uh, present here. So we do all the above testing. And in fact, all of his connective tissue disease serologies are unremarkable. We've also checked in HIV, immunoglobulins, a CBC, and CMP, which are also normal. Notably, though, his hypersensitivity pneumonitis panel comes back positive with two antibodies. We continue the case, given the positive avian proteins, the exposure, the CT scan, as we mentioned, we've made the diagnosis confidently of subacute HP. We start him on a six-week prednisone taper, and he had an initial subjective improvement. He says his dyspnea and his cough were much better, but once he dropped down his prednisone below 15 milligrams a day, his symptoms started to recur. So subsequently, he was started on mycophenolate, 1,000 milligrams BID, to help wean him off further steroids. Six months later, he follows up with us in clinic, and after the initiation of uh, mycophenolate, he's noticed that he's started to progressively develop an increased dry cough and dyspnea exertion. You listen to him, and now you hear chorus by basal crackles on auscultation. So we need to figure out what's going on, right? We've got a gentleman who initially felt better with immunosuppression, um, but now six months later is starting to feel worse. His symptoms are getting worse, and his exam has changed a bit. And so to work this up further, we get a CAT scan, an echocardiogram, and repeat his spirometry. So echocardiogram is done, and this is primarily to make sure we're not missing any cardiac pathology that could account for symptoms, particularly pulmonary hypertension in the patient with lung disease. And we see his echocardiogram looks okay, both the left-sided function as well as markers of pH, the TAPSI, and the RBSP are both okay. We get a CAT scan, and unfortunately, he's got a lot of concerning features here on his CAT scan. What we saw before was primarily mosaicism and ground glass opacities. The ground glass has improved, which is great. We've effectively treated what appeared to be active inflammation on a CT, but in the interim, he's developed signs of pulmonary fibrosis. You see the traction bronchiectasis and the coarse honeycombing that he's developed in just the course of six months, despite treatment with mycophenolate. When we repeat a spirometry, we also see a concerning trend here. His FEC, initially when he came to see us, was 2.4, 72% of predicted and is now down to 1.58, which is 60% of predicted. Uh, he's got a preserved ratio demonstrating that he's continued to have a restrictive deficit there. And if we look back at our criteria and the patient, as you recall, he needs to satisfy just two of these criteria, but satisfies three. We did not get a repeat DLCO, and so we don't know if his DLCO, in fact, dropped greater than or equal to 10% of predicted from the initial appointment to now. Uh, but he did have the physiologic evidence of disease progression with worsening symptoms and a relative FEC decline of 12%. And as mentioned, he had new honeycombing as well as traction bronchiectasis on his high-res CT. What I want to highlight as well is the importance of a multidisciplinary discussion. And that involves pulmonologists, rheumatologists, radiologists, pathologists, and other ancillary support, and that may be respiratory therapists, psychologists, and social workers. We know that patients with interstitial lung disease can be challenging to diagnose and manage, and having a multidisciplinary discussion with multiple specialties can help us become more confident in making the right diagnosis and the right treatment decisions for our patients. Additionally, we know that you know it's important for these patients to have good ancillary support with pulmonary rehab and respiratory therapists to have good mental health support as well, and that the effect of interstitial lung disease on patients' quality of life and subsequently their mental health 
can be profound. And so having multiple specialties working together to make sure that we treat these patients appropriately and as a whole. And so benefits uh, in brief here of having a multidisciplinary discussion include having increased diagnostic confidence by refining a provisional diagnosis, increased diagnostic precision, and enhanced inter-observer agreement on the diagnosis. The other thing I really want to highlight is the importance of education. For patients dealing with interstitial lung disease, not understanding your disease or being diagnosed with interstitial lung disease can be an extremely anxiety-provoking process. Patients often have tremendous anxiety and fear regarding their disease and the prognosis and, and outcomes. And a lot of that is driven by just not knowing enough about their disease process. Unfortunately, there's lots of outdated information that's uh, inaccurate and incomplete that's found on the internet. Uh, we often have patients present to us in clinic you know, that come to us and tell us they Googled their disease and they only have six months to live, which is oftentimes not the case. And so it's important that we provide our patients with adequate and accurate information regarding their disease process. These patients want to know. They want to be able to look things up and read on their own and educate themselves and their families about their disease process. So some reliable sources of information that you can provide from your patients on PPF are from the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, as well as Pinpoint PF with the links present there. So as we reflect upon this case, monitoring for the development of PPF with an evaluation of symptoms, spirometry, and radiographic progression is vital to early diagnosis. You can make the argument with this patient that maybe he should have been seen earlier, that maybe three months uh, rather than six months uh, from his initial visit would have allowed us to capture progressive pulmonary fibrosis sooner before he had irreversible loss of lung function. So making sure that you're reevaluating and monitoring these patients frequently is vital, not only to early diagnosis, but to appropriate management going forward. Clinicians should refer to and utilize the recent international guideline definition for PPF. You know, now that we are fortunate to find criteria, we should make sure that we're, we're using that to capture our patients um, appropriately. And that the prevalence of PPF and hypersensitive pneumonitis is quite high, and it can range between 35 and 58%. And remembering that PPF can occur in a variety of other ILDs as well. And that it's important that we remain cognizant of that and that we remain vigilant in looking for and identifying PPF in our patients with interstitial lung disease. And finally, that clinician should employ the term progressive pulmonary fibrosis and really abandon the previously used terminology you know, to avoid confusion, both in our conversations with our colleagues and our patients, but as well as allowing for unified terminology in the literature. Thank you for your attention today and for participating. Um, please complete your post-test and evaluation for CME credit. Thank you to Boringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals for providing the educational grant to support this program. Please visit pilotforpulmonary.org for more CME opportunities.